and I told you so I'm a kid in a candy store With the leather on the denim I ain't the cure, I'm the venom If you wanna find me, find the taillight Something's coming in, you're gonna wanna take a red eye It's time to go It's time to go Get ready Get ready Good afternoon, what up Wednesday, friends from all over the world, Kelly Dunn, FH Umpires. I'm so glad that you're here and joining me today. Yes, it's what up Wednesday and there are many what's that are up. I decided to really try to take on as many of the things that I've been asked and there's even more that as I was putting on my lashes, I was like, oh my God, I totally forgot about the penalty corner protective equipment question that I keep getting asked. So. There may be bonuses, or we may get to like three of the topics and not, but I'm hoping that you guys will keep me on track. Let's do this together, friends, and try to get through as many of the, what do I have? I have five topics, maybe six with the bonus, who knows? So there you go. I hope everybody's doing really well, and I hope that you've gotten back out and done some of the hockey. I know that England... Started up somewhat last week, uh, a whole bunch on the weekend. Uh, Duncan was reporting from Scotland that one of his games got put back because of a COVID test. We are in university mode. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to try to do every week was to bring you one lesson that I learned from coaching players to bring back into coaching umpiring or something that I connected between the two. So I'm going to say that really quickly, and then we're going to get into saying hello to everybody and then all the topics. Oh, wait, I was going to put on music. Let's see. Can I do that? Oh, my button. My button disappeared. No, it didn't. There it is. Okay. Let me know if you can hear that and if that's too loud or not loud enough or whatever the case might be. It's a little loud for me, so I'm going to turn it down on my end. I don't care what you guys think, but... I need a little less in the old headphones there. Did that work? Yes, a little bit. Okay, cool. Okay, so my one lesson, <laughs> I am very squirrel, squirrel today. Um, the one lesson that I learned today is that I often talk to umpires about how when you get yourself into the state of thinking that it stops your feet from moving. We all think we can do all this, you know, rub our stomach and pat our heads and do all these things at the same time. But inevitably, when I see an umpire who's struggling to be ahead of the play, to be as mobile as they usually want to be, to be proacting the play instead of reacting, it's because they're, they're in here. And they're thinking about something that they just did. Some call that they made, maybe they're not happy with. They're second guessing themselves. They're wondering what their colleague's up to, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, that's, 
then their feet stop moving. Players do the same thing. When they are thinking really hard about what they should be doing in terms of decision making, they stop moving their feet. So their passing and their receiving skills are under threat and they stop being as consistent. So that's what I learned this week. I thought that was very interesting. Can't hear anything other than my voice. No squirrel. Speed what up Wednesday. Okay, so we might not, I'm, I'm going to turn off the music on my end because it's, it's completely, yeah, coming through. Let's see if you can hear. Um, oh, even I can't hear that. So, all right, we're, we're without sound effects today. If Nick is on, he's going to be so excited because he hates it when I use the sound effects. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's say hi to everybody because it looks like there's a whole bunch of people in the crowd. Of course, moderator Niels, first, good work. Cabernet Sauvignon for our friend Rachel Davids. I hope you're doing well, friend. Uh, Greg's here. Hi. You can always still stay here till 1330. 1330, 1930. I can read. I'm very good at this. And you want to see how the timings fit in the Keeley Hour. Challenge accepted. I like it. Tea in the cup tonight. As for me, thank you for Simon Milford. Good to see you out there. Third team friends. Lucio's here as always. My favorite puppy avatar. James is here. Good to see you. Oh, and you meant to say in the discord, the conversation of the tech table on the art red cord was because the player was meant to have a 10 minute yell card, but comms broke down and had her back on after five. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. You know what? That brings up a really good point that I forgot to put in my notes, but let me do this right now. I would like to issue a mea culpa on that red, converse, red card conversation we had last week. So one of the reasons that I like to stick to high level clips when we discuss them is because I feel very confident that I'm able to get the full scope of information that I need in order to be able to help to lead you through the thinking process that we should have. And in that particular clip, I did not have the full story. I thought I had the full story, but I did not have the full story. And I didn't verify the full story myself. So I take full responsibility and accountability for that. So for the umpires who were involved and all their friends who contacted me, thank you for coming forward. And I try to take every one of these things as a learning experience. So that's what I learned from it. And I am going to redouble my efforts to take an open-minded approach to everything and talk about permutations and possibilities rather than shoulds and should nots. So I am grateful for that experience, even though I felt really bad. But that's how you learn, uncomfortable and grow. So that's my mea couple. Thank you very much for everybody who got in touch on that. Lou, you've been away for a couple of weeks. I know you're back and I hope you're good too. I hope your games went well. Let me know. Luke's here, of course. And <laughs> I take this one on the chin, sir. I do. Richard's here. Great to have you. And Ian is ready to rock and roll. I think this is Goddard's. And if it's not, if it's another uh, delegate from the Devon Hockey Empires group, hello, friend. One of my favorite associations out there. Big supporters. Love you guys so much. Uh, Stefan's here. And Scott. Absolutely. Rachel, you, you're just hoping you can get to some hockey. Okay. Yeah. Aren't we all, right? It's just such a... It's an exercise in gratitude because every time it actually happens, we're like, yay, we had hockey. Instead of thinking, of course, we should have had hockey. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> my... T I shake my tea. Like, what's wrong with that? When you use oat milk, it's really good to, to have that. Let's see. Hi, Alpine Pat. You might be new. And what I usually do when somebody's new is I play sound effects. But they don't seem to be working. And I... Oh, wait. <laughs> They're back. Ah, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> okay. I'm really glad because I like to use sound effects. Sam Church is here. Hey, good to see you. And Van Reed, I was starting to say it wrong. Haven't seen you for a hot minute. Good to have you. AJ is here. Andrew, good morning from the country that sees the sun first. Oh, am I going to get this wrong? Australia? Huh, okay. No problem. 
<laughs> Thank you, Greg. Greg is a um, good friend from another sport, and he gave me some suggestions for graphics and actually sent me an Ecamm scene to help me bolster my game a little bit. So just some... But when you're a professional like Greg, the little changes make a big difference. So thank you for that. And I noted that you had a moving overlay that went down across the scene and great transition. And I loved it. It was gorgeous. I was on his basketball stream earlier today. Mike Boyne is here. Another person that I haven't seen for a while. Good to have you. Um, Squirrel. Squirrel is very quiet and I can't seem to get it going. We're going to do a speed what up Wednesday. Michael Vince. Hi, friend. Thank you, Mark. It is, it is a great kitchen. If only I knew how to, if only I knew how to use it better. <laughs> it's all I need. It's all, it's all that both, that both Corey and I need for sure. And you've never focused on the kitchen. Oh, well, don't worry. Neither have I. <laughs> there you go. Sam had the full story. Yeah, there were a few people who did. So thank you for that. God is not part of Devon. Oh, God. Sorry. I think I'm on a roll and then I screw it all up. Goddard's wishes he... Okay, so that's fair. I'm glad we got that. You can finally make a live on Paul Reeves. Holy smokes. I think there's a lot of people in this here, out here on the internet streets. And I've got quite the glare off my glasses here. So I'll try to keep my eyes like this so you can see that. Okay, you're from Devon, South Central. Thanks. My, and Mark Cummings is here. <gasps> Juliana, wait, welcome, good to have you, first timer, welcome to What Up Wednesday, everybody say hi to Juliana, Roger is here, Thomas as always, uh, good New Zealand, who's the front, oh, see, I should just stop saying things because I'm just going to make mistakes, I'm going to stick to the umpiring stuff, you've been busy lately, I hear that, I hear that and I raise you four more busies. <laughs> there you go. Hi, from Uganda. Kaka, great to see you. And if I've mispronounced that, please do phonetically correct me in the comments. And that is, oh, and everybody's, yeah. So Andrew is from New Zealand, but I thought it was Australia. There you go. Anyway, thank you so much for joining in. Whew, big responsibility today. I got to get through a lot of topics. So you raise me, mm, sir. <laughs> Mike Boyne and I are going toe to toe. <laughs> so cool. Okay, let's get to the first topic. I am, okay, 12, 16. I'm going to try to spend between 12 to 15 minutes on each topic. But if something's short, then I get to go over on other topics. I'm just saying. Okay. So this popped up on the Facebooks and I wanted to go over it quickly because this is all about a bully taking a bully. <laughs> so it's a long description, but the gist of it is, is that after a bully was awarded for an injury, but a team had clear possession of the ball, the umpires just kind of assumed that they were going to do that sports person like thing where when the team that was not in possession would, after the bully contact, would send the ball back to the opposing team into their backfield and everybody would be happy. Well, no, friends, what happened in this particular situation is that the team that was not in possession of the ball at the time decided to contest the bully and went off at a sprint and scored the goal while everybody else on the pitch, including the umpires, were standing there going, huh? Yeah. So I wanted to sort of go over this quickly because this is something that might happen to you. Okay. And I do want to sort of go over a couple things in the phrasing of the question, because right here at the end, the question is, as a captain, giving one of your players breaches the spirit of the game like that, what would you do? Would you allow them to score an uncontested goal and even it up? Or would you do nothing and let them let the game play out? Okay. I am interested in your thoughts on this, so I'm going to keep an eye on the comments. I would love to hear what you think about that situation, um, but let me tell you my thought, thoughts first and concurrently and that sort of thing. Hopefully, I don't cut you all off, but I think that it is a very wise approach 
every time you have a bully that you expect the teams not to contest out of good sports play to say those words to the uh to the the teams right at that moment why not just quickly say you're gonna send that ball back right just just confirming just cool okay great you got it great there's nothing wrong with being proactive that way and the person who posed this question in the facebooks said in reply quite a few times during the conversation when that was suggested to them quite a few times was, well, that's coaching. And no, <laughs> that is, that's not a strategic decision. That is your expectation of them fulfilling the spirit of the rule as you see it. And this is why friends, I absolutely hate bullies because there is this realm of ambiguity. There is this possibility for a team to, you know, refuse and be jerks. But here's the thing. If you approach the team that should be giving up the possession in the process of the bully, and you say, you're going to hit it back, right? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they don't. I would just toss them off for misconduct. I would, I would green card that. I would immediately stop the play. If they took it on, Stop the play, off you go. Do I have anything firmly in the rule book to support that? Absolutely not. Is there anybody in the world who would take me to task for that? No. <laughs> okay, but if you don't express your expectations, people can take advantage of it. Okay. The other thing I wanted to bring up about this um, quickly. Okay, wait, maybe I'll just go to the comments first and see what y'all are saying first. Oh, Daniel, there you are. You are here at the right time. My goodness, you haven't been on for a hot minute either. So I was wondering why you didn't come to me with this question and you went to another place. Time to move on, Keely. Okay, hey, sir, Niels, take a knee. <laughs> don't <laughs> don't you be dictating on me here okay um let's see you raise me gms okay you win you win okay um let's see there's there's lots of friendships happening with um all this <laughs> all the kiwis what to do kills choco twist yoga nice to see you callie one of my live streaming friends thanks for popping in and saying hi um, let's see. Yes. Okay. So this was Daniel's, Daniel's question. Okay. Constrained hits instead of bullies. No one likes bullies. Yes. Scott Riley. I agree. Okay. Let's see. Um, <laughs> see you've chosen chaos. I don't know Rupert if how I've managed to do that, but it's probably happened very much. So yes, the spirit of the rules, that's what we're talking about. And you love that solution. Thanks Alpine Pat. I really do think that um, that works out just fine. The, the constrained hit isn't in the rules either. Under the rules of the bully, there's nothing that says that a team can't try to take possession of the ball. But we expect it because we have a common sense cultural application of what we think is being a good player. So... Exactly. Scott, thank you so much. Dissent is not in the rules, but we give, we give personal penalties for it because it's in our expectations. If we set the expectations, we can follow and lead up on them. Scott Riley, bring in the heat as he does. You're placing bets on five items. Niels, I recognize your lack of support here. It was bizarre mainly because he was the only player on the pitch who decided to contest it properly. Yeah, but he's the important one. <laughs> So you, you have to make contact with that player. The one you expect to give up the possession, you say, you're going to hit it back, right? Yes. And you can turn to the other player who's going to come take the bully and say, they're going to hit it back to you in the backfield. So there you go. Everybody meet the minds. You don't want surprises, Right. We want the surprises to come from amazing skill and really cool decision making and unfortunate mistakes. And, but we want it to come from the hockey, not from the administration of the rules ever. We want that to be very, very clear. So 
Ian, I've been known to say, presume it will be an uncontested bully or words to that effect. Yeah. Well, if uncontested bully makes sense to the people who are, to whom you are speaking, awesome. For me, I'd be making it even more simple. I'd be saying, you hit the ball back to that person over there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Will do. Roger, you would explain politely to both captains that to maintain a civil game and ask the offending team to permit the other team to score an untested goal if they don't feisty game. And, and this is the thing, right? So Daniel said in his comment that he was expecting everything to go to absolute sh right? And that's a reasonable expectation. So you're not imposing something that is, is, is bad for the game. You're not being technical or officious or whatever. You're doing this because you want all the players to go home feeling that they had a fair game. That's our... Number one job, fair game, safety of the players. Two, two jobs, modus operandi. Why are you there? So there you go. Stefan, I've learned in my experience that common sense is not always and not always issued to people. Yeah. We know that, right? And that's why we take a little bit of an extra step. And Juliana, you agree with that? Greg, you had one this weekend where rather than have it hit back, the team getting the ball back ended up taking it, firing it back to the line, to their back line themselves. That fried a lot of heads too. Huh. So they, so instead of hitting it to the opposing team who should have had possession, they hit it to their own team. Back there. That's a jerk move. It's just a jerk, jerk move. Okay. Um, Alex, of course you had to win a hockey rules quiz. I hope you said, and I thank FH umpires for everything that I just won. I, I, I hope you, I hope you gave tribute. There you go. So that's, that's a big thing, right? Once, once you haven't taken the preventative steps, then you're, you're getting yourself into more of a pickle. So just prevent and you're going to be fine. Any other questions about that? Let me know because I think I'm ready for the next one. That was really quick. The team that should have had possession ended up with possession. Huh. Okay. So the oppose. Uh, mm. Okay. I, I'm sure I could figure it out if I wasn't in the middle of trying to do this live. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> AJ. It's a good thing I know your personality is a little bit more, so I know when you're kidding. <laughs> Always good. Okay, question number two, unless we had any other things. Okay, on the discords, I had uh, an interesting question posed to me, and actually it came to me privately, and I said, no, 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 I want, I want everybody to engage with this on the discord, and that's something that I'm trying to do more often because instead of just having a private one-on-one -on -one with somebody in chat, which I'm happy to do, instead we can share the wealth and share the discussion around more and more people. And that's important to me for a few reasons, because first of all, if I can multiply my impact on people instead of one-to-one, -one, it's one of many, awesome. Also, it gives me a better sense of what people's level of understanding of certain rules is. So I can think, well, obviously this isn't a you know, the, the rule is X and is interpreted this way. But when I find out that a whole bunch of people are struggling with the very same question, that gives me reason to think more carefully about how I present it. What are the holes in the arguments? Why is this a problem? And, you know, talk through it in it with a different approach. So this one came about, this was an example of a penalty stroke. Lynn Joe is on the board. That, uh, that let me see if I can just mute that. Um, a penalty stroke that an umpire was questioning as to whether this was within playing distance of the ball. And to them and to a few other people who commented, that was not within playing distance. Okay, so we'll come back to the video, but I want to go through the rules a little bit so that we're all on the same page and we know what's going on because that's important to do. 
Okay. Greg's off. He's replay squad now. Let's see. Whoops. 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 That's a... <laughs> All of my buttons are assigned to the wrong things. Okay. So first off, is that the 2004? No, that's this one. Nope. I assigned it to the wrong button. Live streaming funsies. None of those are on. So what you're seeing in the white <laughs> is the current definition of what playing distance is under the rule book. Okay. And this is important because ever since 2004, a player is required to be within playing distance of the ball. Okay. I, that's a little dark, but maybe you can see it. The player taking the stroke must stand behind and within playing distance of the ball before taking the stroke. This has been in place since 2004, okay? Prior to that, the rule was that the player taking the stroke shall stand close to and behind the ball. And in the process of taking the stroke, the player could take one step toward the ball, but the rear foot could not pass in front of the first one before the ball had been played. <sighs> That's a lot of stuff. It was very technical. It was very limited. And it was very, very tic-tacky. Of all the things that the Rules Committee has been doing really well over the last two decades is taking out rules that are tic-tacky like this, that are really not necessary in order to get to the result, which is that it's a stationary push of the ball against a stationary goal, goalkeeper. It's a true penalty. So taking that into account and that spirit into account, what we're seeing now under the 2004 rules is, whoops, the wrong one there. Here it is that they just stand behind and within playing distance. And then the playing distance definition, as I bring it here, is the distance within which a player is capable of reaching the ball. Now, back in the old days, for those of you who haven't been around as long as I have, <laughs> let me tell you a story about how it used to be that we played penalty strokes. And the way that we adjudicated them is that we would have the player, and maybe this wasn't custom in your area, but this is what I saw fairly often, was the player would measure up their distance being close to the ball by laying their stick down. And that was sort of accepted as a common interpretation that if you were within, you know, 38 inches of the ball, that that was close to the ball. And it would take you about one step to, you know, to, to traverse that distance. So that was the standard. So now within playing distance should be something more expansive, shouldn't it? It should be something bigger because we've relaxed the interpretation. We've relaxed the standard. Yeah, you just have to be within playing distance. Now, if playing distance was considered one stick length away, things like obstructions, third party especially, would be adjudicated quite differently in our sport. We would be a lot less, we would give fewer than we, than we already do because we'd say, well, you're not within a stick length of that, of that play. <laughs> so what I'm getting at with all of this sort of thing is that it really isn't important. It's not supposed to be technical and efficient and strict. It's supposed to be, yeah, just within playing distance of the ball. Can you reach it? And that doesn't mean can you reach it without stepping in a direction or not, because stepping is part of the stroke. So it's fine. So going back to that video, let's go back to it here. We'll have a look. Uh, the replay is obviously quite a bit smaller, so it's easier to see. The first, the first thing that I want you to notice is as we're looking at this, and I've just paused it for us, is that 
is not very we're not at the right angle to really see how far away he is from the ball. We think we can see the distance, but actually we're turned to the side. So we don't have a very good view whatsoever. Let's see if I can. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Not using my iPad today. I was going to diagram on it. Can't do that. If we were side on to this, we'd be able to see how far. If we were also vertically behind, we, we'd be, get another gauge of how far because he's off to the side and behind. But this angle is the, completely the wrong angle to see that. And then when we play it through, the player just, he takes a stutter step. There's nothing, there's no big run, there's not a big vertical distance covered towards the ball. So it looks different than what we see every, necessarily every stroke. And in the Discord server, if you're a part of it and you go through the general chat and you saw the discussion, you'll see that there was quite a bit. Um, it was like, hey, here's a video of the best strokes taken by the top players. And not many of them took that kind of step. A few of them did. A lot of them stood close to the ball and just one step, boom. And that to me is a signal of something. And I want you all to guess what it is. <laughs> so I'm going to go into the comments to see what's going on. And I'm looking forward to your thoughts on this. Greg's gone, has a meeting, replay squad, ciao. Oh, Goddard, you are a little, just a little bit. My comments are off to the side because I moved them that way. I'm still happy to have you. I don't care if you're late. You were only there a couple of weeks ago. I, I don't think I got to Devon when I was over there. Back in the other decade, etc. So there you go. Scott, following the spirit of the principles of the game, you'd consider 12.1, even if it wasn't within playing distance, did the stroke taker gain any extra unfair advantage? Scott, I'm just going to assign that sound effect to your comments every time because you're doing a great job, as you often do, bringing the heat. We'll get back to that advantage question there. Stefan, some coaching you've seen still measure with a stick for taking a stroke. Yeah, and that was posted in the Discord as well that um, some uh, umpire who I don't recognize uh, called the rules guru in Brisbane uh, showed that as being within playing distance. That's wrong. It's just wrong. It's old fashioned and it's not been updated much like the way in which we refer to penalty corners and 15 meter hits and 23 meter restarts because it's, it's something that doesn't happen very often. Penalty strokes do not get called very often. They don't get trained very often, not as much as, you know, you would, you would think. And so it's something that when you get past the top levels and you're starting to filter your way down to grassroots hockey, they're just not seeing it very much. So the old school ways prevail. And that's okay, but that is not current rules. And I, what I don't like is when old-fashioned things that haven't been thought about and, and, and you haven't considered what's happened with the history of the rules and the reason why we're, the reason why we're relaxing things, if you don't take that into account, you're going to get to really th the kind of calls that players look at you and go, what? Why are you, what? <laughs> Why? Why? So we did note as we came through the discussion that it wouldn't be that you would wait as an umpire. So let's just say, hypothetically speaking, that the stroke taker does stand not within playing distance of the ball, such that they need to take a running start in order to get up to that penalty stroke. If they start that way, you are the boss. You are in control of what's happening with that penalty stroke. And you do not start the penalty stroke until you're happy with where the players are. So if you're not happy with where the attacker is, you say, that's not within playing distance. Can you please step a little closer to that ball? And you might say it's one step or two steps or whatever it is that you're not happy with. But I have literally never seen that to be a problem. 
which gets back to Scott's point. Let's see if anybody else has picked that up as well. Um, oh, you got, you got stuff. We could do some measurements using the umpire shadow if we knew the time of day. <laughs> trigonomics what come on the longer step is probably not an advantage overall no need to be pedantic yeah playing distance is so fun to apply with obstruction yeah because there are there's both players are moving and there's where is the ball vis-a-vis the 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 position of both players and those two people are moving and how fast is the ball going and where are you vis-a-vis other players and the sideline and the goal and all these things come into play. It's an intentionally vague concept that allows us to really employ the advantage principle. So if we aren't thinking about how this affects the taking of a penalty stroke, we fail. So Getting back to that video that was put up on uh, stroke takers and why so many of the top people were still close to the ball, not within playing distance, but close to the ball because they were only a stick length away. Why did they do that? Because it helped them score more. They were able to get their stroke off faster and by, and, and, and just with all kinds of deception, through the goalkeeper. Now, I know there's probably a lot of goalkeepers here in this chat. You tell me, is it harder to read a stroke that you only have that split second of motion, that one step in the quick shot, or if a player takes a running start at something and then really gears up and... I think I know, even though I'm not a goalkeeper, I think I know what the answer to that question is. You tell me. Uh, you think the part about the behind the ball gets close. Some stroke takers are close to be in line with the ball. And that is because that refers to the drag. Now, I'm not going into the drag because I want to get on to the next topic very quickly because dragging on penalty strokes is a whole nother thing that really gets a bee under my bonnet because people get really, really unexpectedly weirded out about dragging on penalty strokes. Uh, Steve, seriously, he's not even kidding. The penalty stroke action was fine. Yeah. Taking too many sticks probably makes it more likely that he'll not flick the ball. Yeah. Right. The more variables, another thing I've learned from coaching players, (laughs) the more variables you introduce to a skill, the more steps, the longer the distance, the whole thing the more opportunities there are for the skill to break down. That's why you teach skills and progressions where you just isolate one little thing and you just, you just do one thing and then you add the next step. So I'm doing, I've been doing a lot of coaching on hitting in the last two weeks and I've been breaking down the skill by just like, okay, here's your wrist action. This is just your wrist action from your stick being at your waist back here and your waist over here on the follow through. That's all we're doing. We're not moving. We're not swinging further back than that. We're not even contacting the ball yet. So you take out the variables, you practice the motor skill, you get it in there. So yes, that's another reason why. If you don't, if it doesn't hugely improve the execution of the skill, why introduce more variables? Top players are smart. They've learned these things. Richard, playing distance is a stretch with an outstretched arm and a stick. So unless they run at the ball, they're in playing distance. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure if I'm putting the words together the way that you are in my brain. So I'm not sure. But in the words of a famous Supreme Court justice, which I like to say on a regular basis on these live streams, it's just like porn. You'll know it when you see it. And it's more than just, it's more than just distance. Playing distance has so many other factors involved. Steps. Taking too many sticks, too many steps. Yes, exactly. Okay. Running start is easy to defend. Thank you, Niels. Okay. Here comes a goalkeeper letting me know that I am not insane on this. 
Similar issue to this on the other side, goalkeepers will often set themselves up with the very back of their heels on the line, then prop themselves onto their toes before the penalty stroke is taken. True. Uh, Daniel, while longer stepping provides momentum for the harder push, gives the keeper longer to read your movements. Yeah, and you're, they're only nine meters away. Like, it's not that far. Way harder with a short, quick save. Thank you, Stefan. Longer run-ups gives us more time to read what you're thinking. Yes, because the players give little cues, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad we settled all that. So the Coles Notes version, it, it's probably fine. <laughs> and if it's not fine, you can correct it before it happens. But I've never seen it not be fine. Heading to close to half a kilo hour now. Oh, okay. Let's get to the next one. This will be fast because I just wanted to touch on this because I've been getting a lot of people, I don't know why, asking me this question about early breaking defenders on penalty corners. So sorry, there's a little extra like loop around there that doesn't really have the emphasis, but people are asking, when can the early breaking defender rejoin the penalty corner defense? And the short answer to that is when the penalty corner is over. If it's retaken, if the penalty corner isn't over and another penalty corner is awarded, that defender who has been sent for breaking early cannot rejoin the play. There was a lot of confusion when this rule first got introduced back in, I mean, this got me in 2012. I've told the story about how I was on the pitch in Antwerp and I had people radioing me from the sideline telling me that we got it right. No, we got it wrong. Yeah, we got it right all within the same play. And it was just, you know, let's not adjust a rule in the middle of a, of a game. I, I would say an Olympic qualifier, it's kind of poor practice, but hey, that's what happened. <laughs> but that is the long and the short of it. And let's see if I can get this to the right. Yeah. So this, this was the question again, oops, how do I get this gone? This was the question, settling the debate, runner one breaks early, sent to halfway at what point the defense is allowed five before they can come back again. So this is what the rule reads, 13.6, and this is the provision for the penalty corner being completed. Now, for those of you who like to rely on the app and on your phone, don't for this. I don't think it has yet been updated because it caught me <laughs> a few days or a couple weeks ago. And I included, you can see there's a little line at underneath F there, just off to the left. That is an indication that something has been amended in the rules in this version. And that is a blank space where G used to be. And that used to be when a bully was awarded. Now, when a bully's awarded, that does not complete a penalty corner. Another penalty corner must be taken. But that's another story. But this is the situations under which a penalty corner is awarded. And by the way, friends, <laughs> when you have questions like that, oh, what are you doing? Let's fix this because that makes me upset. What up Wednesday? Oh, no, not that one. You're going to see all my notes. Oh my God, my cheat notes. You saw everything. So when you have questions like this, can I just remind you that you can come to fhempires.com. Hey, look at that. Look, I'm wearing exactly the same outfit, just different hair. You can open the search button. You can type in early break, for example, hit return. And within the speed of the internet, holy smokes, there's a Ruly Tuesday on this very topic. And it is Ruly Tuesday episode nine. That's the short URL for it, RT009. And that'll take you right to the Ruly Tuesday episode. And you can come here and you can watch it in all its glory on the YouTubes. And there's even a transcript. So you can Read all the details. Chaos contained. So there you go. That is the story with early breaking defenders. So just a little rule reminder for all of us. I hope that was helpful.
Let's see where we're at. Uh, we have 45 minutes for less than three subjects. <laughs> Whew. Um, should we introduce quarters in my live streams? Yes, we should. <laughs> that would be very, very helpful. Okay. Um, Paul, sorry to be late. Had to cook tea. Uh, oh, boy, that sounds... Now I'm hungry. Thank you, Paul. So rude. Uh, coming back to the game this year, it took you a fair while to get your head around to work out when a PC was retaken versus awarded a new. Just from reading it, it's easier to see it in actions, though. And it, the way it used to be explained was, it again, it was one of those things that made things so complicated, and we made it unnecessarily complicated. So we've got this. Just look at 13.5 and you'll be fine. It might be more useful to officials and players, but I read that a defender can participate again if a sub would have been able to, or I would have blown my whistle for the end of the half. Yeah, but you would have to know when a sub was able to, and that would mean that you'd still have to know when 13.5. And that's because it used to be in two separate places. The end, the end of a penalty corner used to be for the end of time and for the purpose of substitution. And I can't remember when that changed. Could have been around 2015. Maybe the 2017 rule book, even. And I mean, that was, a, that was an absolute sh show. Like, <laughs> so it's been simplified. This rule about what a PC is officially over is so fun. Trying to explain to players who aren't aware of the change. Yeah. I know. All rule changes are hard because we're the only ones who keep up with it. We also have Keely Quarters. <laughs> Hello, we don't have time for this today, but uh, Pamil, I will go through aerial fences next week because with the help of Alex and all of the other Dutch speaking people on the live streams, we are going to go through the official Dutch KNHB aerial quiz together. That's what we're going to do next week because it'll be fun. So that Pamil, please come back next week because we will undoubtedly go through everything and have a lot of debates. 90 minutes on aerials. Okay, it was for substitution and for ending time. One set, another set for when it was over. For first hit it, no. No, that wasn't it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I could be more diplomatic sometimes, James, but would it really be me? Okay. Let's look at the Hooft class hullabaloo. Fun times. Topic four, look at that. 1251, we're doing fine. So this is making the rounds because it's fun to look at dramatic situations like this. <laughs> oh, man. So many things. So let's just sort of play it through a few times. Now, obviously, the first problem we have is that we've got a vertical video with very poor resolution. I think it's only like, I don't even think it's 720p. I think it's like a 480p video. So it's not very great. These are, yes, the top players in... Uh, the Netherlands going at it in the club match. It's Amsterdam and Orange Rude. Probably didn't say that right. So I'm going to call them the white team and the red team, as many people do. And we're going to go through all of the th things. The conclusion, first of all, in case you're wondering, and you haven't been on any of the previous discussions out on the socials about this, is that no cards were given. None. No cards were given. This reminds me very much of my worst game ever in 2006, which I talked about on the Christmas live stream. So if you, if you didn't catch that and you want to know how my life almost fell apart during a game, CAC Games 2006, I had something like this. I had a melee and didn't give any cards out of it. So let's break down what we're seeing here as best we can. And it won't be easy. So I'm going to go back. 
I think what we can see first off is that this, this player, this red player who's on the ground here, there's some hijinkery going on. That's the technical term. There are some hijinks occurring. And I'm not sure we don't have enough video at this point to know what's happening with the white player, but I'm suspicious. And as an umpire, your first cue is at this moment, stop watching the ball. You, especially when this is right in front of you and your colleague is too far away to administer any sort of advice on this, you focus on this and say to your colleague, take the ball. I need to watch something or whatever the case might be over the radio. Okay. You can tell that he meets up with this player here and there's another, maybe there's a conversation. Maybe there's a little contact. Who knows? More hijinkery is going on. This player is instigating stuff. Okay. Trouble. Your spidey, sense, spidey senses should be tingling. Okay. And as he rubs off the mark, Okay, and this is a, this is an intentional sort of, you know, movement here. Then you have the white defender stepping in and putting the red player to ground. Now, when you watch it in real time, which we'll do right here, I think many of us, our first inclination would be to say that that white defender does nothing wrong. I've watched it a whole bunch of times and I've blown it up and looked at it. And I do think that the white defender steps in to basically pick off. And actually I have the, do I have the players going the wrong way? Anyway, it doesn't matter if it's a white, let's just say white player, red player, and we don't have to worry about who's attacking or defending because it's, it's a pretty sparse clip. We can't really, I think I've got that wrong. But yeah, that's, that's usually done to free up an attacker. But I think what he's done there is he's eliminating a defender that way. No, other way around. Anyway, I think there is something here in the white player. The red player does go down like they're shot. And we've talked about this. We have remedies we have been instructed that this is a form of misconduct that should be dealt with as a form of misconduct. And then we have another red player coming, charging in, and really quite clearly smoking the white player who was responsible for this main collision that we're looking at. So what do you think? Because I have three cards in my head and they are all different colors. <laughs> what do you think? Let's go to comments. Roger, 10 minute yellow card for white and red card for red. It's orange red. Yeah, I know. That's why I called them orange road, you know, because I'm, I'm fancy that way. Yellow card 10 for the shoulder check and red for the retali retaliation. What about the red card got off the floor and shoved the white player in the back, which started the whole thing? Yeah, he's the one who dove. I think that's diving. And I think that needs to be addressed. Because that was not, not like... When you saw the white player get smoked, I mean, he flew. <laughs> you can't fake that. But the falling backwards with the knees bending and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Yeah, no cards. And that's, that's Tomas. Oh, I'm going to have to have a word with him. The white player knew exactly what he's doing. Intentional block. Yep. And I think the physical nature of that, even though it's an off ball, so even though it's not on the ball, that is still interference with a player. So there is a foul in that. Okay. But definitely can be, if that creates a disadvantage, that can be dealt with with personal penalties. 
five minute yellow for the first play, 10 minute for white. <sighs> okay. Hmm. That's a lot. 10 minute and red for red. Okay. Look, officials make mistakes all over the place. We talk about this and this is not because I want to pinpoint mistakes, but I want to talk about strategies. Green for the swan diver, yellow for white, red for sprinting and, and punching slash, yeah. And Luke, that's where I'm going with this. That's what I see. Okay, there's a bit of simulation, yeah. In the red player's defense, you don't think, yeah, maybe, maybe. But it would be hard to lose track of him. And that's, that's my friend Tomas. I think he knows. I think he knows. So just to go back to this again, let's watch what the, pit, the controlling side umpire is doing here. Okay? So at the moment, charge comes in now. Watch what the controlling umpire does. She runs right in there. And if you've heard me talk about my experience in 2006, I explain that this is one of the many causes of my mistake and not being able to deal with that melee properly is because I charged right in there. I was like, oh, I was going to separate this person, this person. And I got very aggressive. I got very caught up in the emotionality of the moment. And I split the players apart. And then all that happened. And I was just, I was wired. I was absolutely wired. And I had no clue what had happened. I didn't know who instigated. I didn't know who did, who had done what, because that is that level, that level of adrenaline and activation is so distracting. You cannot possibly keep track of everything that's happened. Okay. So especially when the tempers are that high and there could be fists flying and there's, there could be more violence on the table. It's not for you to stop it. It's for you to stand back, stay safe and take notes. Also, that umpire's colleague was keeping a distance and that's fine, but I didn't see much indication from that umpire that they were doing their main job, which is also as the supporting umpire to take notes. In my view, that is the best way to handle a melee. Okay. So if you have the chance, because things aren't too physical to separate players and you can use your whistle and you can get them away, then as the controlling umpire, you will do that while the supporting umpire is sitting there going, yeah, number five with the punch. But if you don't have that kind of level of safety for yourself, you will also be sitting there going, check, 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 and taking down your notes. And then you get together with your colleague and you talk about what you're going to do together. Okay. Stay back. Keep an eye on the bigger picture. Absolutely, Rachel. Thank you very much. Red, 10 minute yellow for the block, white player, green card for the simulation. Yep. Absolutely. It's so hard, right? And I think, I don't know if it, you know, cause I, I literally like, I was like, am I, am I in that game? Cause she looks like me, <laughs> blonde, little skinnier, but still looked like me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder if that umpire's personality is like mine, tends to get animated and ag aggressive. And, and you want to assert yourself in those situations. If you have that personality, you want to be assertive. And you have to stay calm and you have to stay detached and you have to keep your eyes big and watching everything that's going on. Okay. Did he have his stick higher than, eh, I don't know. I'm not sure if that was really much of an issue. Okay. <laughs> VAR. Roger. Mm. <laughs> we do not have VAR. End of story. We have video referral or video review, which is VR. Ugh. 
bothers me. Step back, take notes. Wouldn't be able to prevent. Yeah, you can't. You can't. I, I mean, you, you can't prevent at this point. You are, but the only way to prevent this thing from happening in the future is to deal with what happens in the moment. And things, things will slide. Things are sliding. There's more simulations happening in that particular league, especially. And they're the leaders in the world. It's the best league in the world, the best club hockey. And that's what we're seeing. More sharp whistles. Stop the game when the situation escalated. Then you can discuss. Yeah, I'd, I'm not really, it's hard to tell in the audio when the whistles came and when they didn't and that sort of thing. But yeah. Yeah, Richard, after when things are safe and the, the, best, the best way if you can't get involved in there but you have the ability to con make contact with the captain is be like, hey, you get your players over there right now or you're walking as well. That kind of thing. I don't like to threaten, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, okay. Yellow for the first dive because of what it caused. Eh, yeah, I mean, maybe, but <laughs> keep in mind, daughters, nobody's given a card yet that I've seen <laughs> for a dive yet. If you've seen one, please tell me now and I'll try to find the footage, but we haven't seen it in international hockey yet. We haven't seen it in... Dutch club. We haven't seen it in German club. We haven't seen it in Belgian club. We haven't seen it where I would expect to see the leaders and the best umpires in the world with the players who are, have the most at stake. I haven't seen it happen yet. It's not, it's, and the first card for a dive is not going to be a yellow. I think. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm animated. <laughs> yes, indeed. You do have us. Instinct makes you want to step in. Yep. Yeah. I mean, for some people, for some people have very different personalities and they're not looking to jump in there right away. They're, they're, they're more introverted that maybe, you know, they're not as, um, they're not as activated. They're calmer. So that's, that's why I get so mad because VR is a travesty to sport. Our video review, our VR is just a million times better. It's not perfect. It is not perfect, but it is so good compared to that. I will not have it tarnished. Daniel, if we haven't met before, Welcome to the stream. Thanks for tuning in. Great to see you. Green card to the first red player for instigating or provoking. Diving. Diving. He dove. He dove. He dove. We really want to start nailing down that decision. Um, oops. Get you back there. A yellow card to the white player for intentionally taking off the red player. And a red card to the second. Red. Yep. It, it, that's what... Yeah. I mean, I kind of swayed on a couple things the first couple times. And now that's just... It's just even to that. There's like, there's a, a, a traffic light in that play. Although the yellow and the green are simultaneous. Yeah, absolutely. It's instinct, right, Roger? I mean, they're, they're separating the combatants because they they want to stop the actual immediate conflict rather than thinking, how do we prevent escalation? So they're going for the de-escalation before they've even prevented further escalation. And that's not the way, like it just, yeah, it doesn't work, does it? I know, you think I'm being hyperbolic, but I'm not. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for your contributions on that. It's good to know that I'm not insane. And that's how we all saw it. 
Remember, the reason that we analyze this is not to criticize what we've seen, the performances of the umpires on the pitch, but to pre-plan and to grease our wheels in our brains so that when the situation happens to us, and I don't care what level of hockey you're doing, you have to go in with not assuming something will happen, but planning the outcomes regardless of whether you think it's a probable thing or not. So rehearsing it in your brain will get you to the point because I bet for one or both of those umpires, that could have been the first time they'd had a physical melee like that. Because the first time it happened to me, I was completely unprepared for it. I didn't have a plan in place. I didn't expect it to happen in women's international hockey. And I made mistakes as a result. And I don't want you to make mistakes when you get out there. I want you to go in there and say, hey, this was really awful, but I handled it well. And we were able to have the best game we possibly could after that moment. And the league reputation, integrity, and all those sort of things, competition, the tournament, whatever it is, is intact because we dealt with things the right way. That's what I want for you so much. So that's why we go through these situations. Um, someone has to lead. I don't know if that's out the door with the cards. Who knows? Um, <laughs> it's not about, it's not having the objective of seeing it. It's planning. You've got the plan in place. You know what you're looking for. If it happens, if it happens. Okay. Oh, I just, I'm so sorry, you guys. It's got to be so hard. And we're, we're a family, right? We're a hockey family. And family's fighting right now over this whole GMS thing. There's some big fights happening, and I don't like to see it. Diving is only for swimming pools. Excellent. Okay, one more topic. I've got 20 minutes. I'm excited. Okay. The best topic that I've ever come up with, the dropkick goalkeepers. <laughs> and if you don't know why that's great, it's because you don't know who the dropkick Murphys are. It down. Okay. So this was posted on Reddit first or maybe second. I don't know. And... I'll just mute the clip because there's no really helpful audio. But at the point that we see, the goalkeeper is walking towards the top of the 15-meter circle line. And the ball is sort of between their two blockers sort of thing. And the goalkeeper drops the ball and kicks it up the field. I'm pretty sure that's still within the 15-meter. It's... I, it's it's hard to tell because there's yellow lines and red lines or and yeah yellow and white and I don't know. So let's talk about whether this is legal or not. This topic comes up. Let's see. I have to do this. Okay. This topic comes up about I don't know once every year. Goddards, what do you think? Once every year, two years? And people say a variety of incorrect things. <laughs> and sometimes they get it right as well. But this is the rule that we're dealing with, 10.2. When the ball is inside the circle, they are defending, and they have a stick in their hand, they can use their stick, feet, leg, kickers, legs, or leg guards, or any other part of their body, their head, their butt, their anything to deflect the ball over the back line or play the ball in any other direction. They just can't do anything that is dangerous to other players. Okay. Yay. This is far simplified from what we've had in the past. And what I want to tell you right away, spoiler alert, is that even under the past rules, this would have been okay. Because it was kickers. Kickers were, you were able to do anything with your kickers in terms of propelling the ball. It was, you couldn't do things with your hands and you, you know, all that kind of stuff in long directions. But kickers were always fair game. Okay. Now, 
what we have to consider, hang on, let me go back to this for a bit <laughs> so I can check my notes, stay on track. Okay. What is happening here is that this goalkeeper is taking a free hit. I think they're taking a 15 meter free hit. It could have been that the ball went off the back line. It could be a defensive free hit. It doesn't matter. The rules for taking a free hit are the same. And in order to do that, oh, hang on. See, now I have to go back to the other scene, do this. Okay. To take a free hit legally. Did I take, did I get the right ones? Huh? Don't worry. Let's get the full actual rules of hockey up on my screen. <laughs> so I can show you. Sometimes I don't clip things properly. It happens. Okay. Oh yeah, it should be there. I'm just scared that I've got the wrong stuff up. Okay, let's see, playing the ball, 10.2. Oh, yeah, I did miss that part. Okay, here we go. I'm going to blow it up. I'm just talking to myself right now because I feel like I should fill space. Okay, here it is. To the rescue. This is the rest of 13.2, which is a little bit more important. Okay. This is sub D. The ball is moved using a hit, push, flick, or scoop. Okay. That is important. So if you are going to instigate a free hit, you have to do so using a hit, push, flick, or scoop. And that brings to... Oh, the definitions. <laughs> I thought I had it also planned out well. A hit, striking or slapping the ball, using a swinging movement of the stick towards the ball. A push, moving the ball on the ground with the stick, blah, blah, blah. Flick, pushing the ball so it is raised off the ground. Doesn't expressly say a stick, but. Scoop, raising the ball, mm, mm, mm. But, oh yeah, but flick and scoop refer back to the push. And the push has a stick performing the action. So what I'm trying to tell you through all this convoluted, confusing stuff is that in order for that goalkeeper or in order for a free hit to be conducted legally, the first contact has to be with the stick. Now, We've got all those things in place. So let's talk about whether this particular play is legal or not. And I'm going to go to the comments to know what's happening. <laughs> I love this one. Seeing this loads. Awesome skill. Hi, CJ. That's a, f uh, yeah, it's America. Let's see. Yeah, see, this is the thing. He is always going to be associated with this. He is just forever going to be that guy who in some National League game assisted a goal, basically. Where is Simon Mason to show it's when it's done? Nope. <laughs> You've seen me go through all the rules now, Alpine Pat, so I'm sure you're like, oh, now I understand. Correction made. Poop. I... I'm totally cool with that. And this is what happens is sometimes I'm behind in the comments and then I show you what the correct answer is. And then you're like, oh, I actually typed that thing that was wrong. It's okay. We're all friends here. We're all here to learn. Simon Mason used to do it. So it must be legal. As long as nobody's disadvantaged by the fact that the ball is in the hands of the goalkeeper, not dangerous, it's legal. Exactly. So you can break that into the two components and we can deal with the, the kicking high down the field part. We essentially treat that as an aerial ball, okay? It is an intentional raised pass 
that we will apply aerial rules to. So it has to be safe on the way up within that five meters, and it has to be safe on the way down according to aerial rules as they stand right now. And then, so that's, that's the back half of it. And the front half of it is the actual execution of the kick. And as Neil says, as long as nobody's disadvantaged by it being in the goalkeeper's hands, there's nothing under 10.2 that says that, that, that a goalkeeper can't carry the ball like that. <laughs> it's weird. And if an attacker was to come and apply pressure and try to get the ball, that could be construed as obstruction. But if there's nobody around, who cares? Who cares? Nobody cares. Michael. The kick is fine was the ball and the sticker in the hands. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They can use their blockers to move the ball in any way in which they desire, as long as it's not obstruction. I don't know who Ronald Jansen is, but sounds like he's dope. Okay, we're not dealing with over the back line stuff. This is how I'm going to stay on track on a Keeley Hour today, you guys. Um, let's see. As long as it's safe and in the circle, it's okay. Yeah. But is, but it is an aerial. I know we're not doing it, but it is an aerial. Yeah. Yeah. And it landed safely. It was fine. It didn't, it didn't land in between two players. I don't think. I don't really care because everybody is like, oh my God, this drop kick. It's really illegal. And I'm like, no, it's not. Don't go to Reddit. Okay. Don't go to Reddit for your umpiring answers. <laughs> Don't go to Facebook for your umpiring answers. Unless you see and you know there are top people replying. Practice safe asking. Practice safe umpire discussing. Simon Mason used to flick it onto his kicker with a stick first. Exactly. And that made it legal. So there was a, there was a, somebody put on the Reddit thread, oh, but you can see in the other video that her defender picked up the ball and put it in her, obviously that's not legal. <laughs> like that, the, no stick commenced the free hit there. So it's not legal. It's hilarious, but not legal. <sighs> AJ, 15, I'm sure it was just a typo, right? It was just a typo. So the free hit or 15 meter would have been taken before the video started. That's what I'm hoping. And so this is what I'm doing is I'm not assuming what happened before that. I am not saying that obviously the goalkeeper's carrying it. So they couldn't have started the free hit legal. Maybe they did. Maybe a player pushed it with their stick and, you know, moved it up into an aerial dribble and put it up in their hands. Or maybe the goalkeeper flicked it up. Maybe. Andrew Isaacs used to do it too. Okay. We have the beginning of a sweeper keeper in that clip. I don't know what that is, but it's probably a funny joke that I do not understand the reference to. Exactly. I don't know, but I'm not going to assume because then I'm going to have to issue a mea culpa next week. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Okay. I don't want that. Yeah. We don't see it. So we don't know. Okay. Atlanta and Sydney. If the stick first, fine. If only picked up, so surely is a free hit 15 meter needs stick contact first. Correct. Okay. So I'm glad you guys all understand the requirements. And I mean, this is kind of like, in a lot of ways, this makes me feel like the within playing distance of a penalty stroke and all this kind of stuff is like, we're, we're looking for reasons that people can't do stuff. Why? We should be looking for reasons to get out of the player's way. So our spirit, our impetus, our modus operandi should be, we are here to allow the players to play to the best of their ability and then direct them when they need it into the lane that will allow them to do that. Okay, that's what we're there for. Not to stop them from doing things, not to be the gatekeepers. So let's keep that in mind when we're looking at all these interesting clips is how can we, how can we let this play on? Yep. 
There you go. Stefan, you got mad skills, dude. Okay, 123, I've got a bonus. <laughs> but I have no graphics for it, okay? So the bonus question is this, and I'm not sure if I may have mentioned this during the Tokyo Olympics when I was ranting about the penalty corner equipment regulation that was imposed that required the Tokyo umpires to give penalty corners if a face mask or any other protective equipment like knee guards was worn after the penalty corner was over. 13.5, we just did that. And to potentially give cards if that happens up the field. I knew that it was going to cause confusion. You don't vary rules for a tournament. You can vary regulations because regulations need to accommodate the different requirements of that location, that level, that whatever the case might be. But varying a rule for the biggest tournament on the planet for our sport. So I've been getting a lot of questions. Should it be a penalty corner if a player wears a face mask after a penalty corner is over and they play the ball outside the circle? Okay, is everybody clear on what the, the, the question is? I can type it out on the screen. Somebody can type it in the comments. Should an umpire ward a penalty corner if a player, if a defensing, defensing, defending player wears a face mask and plays the ball after the penalty corner is over and that ball is outside the circle? My answer is no. It's a free hit. Unless it's repetitious or egregious or I don't know. You can consider it being intentional. But no, it's a free hit because that's what the rules of hockey state. The variation that was employed in the Tokyo Olympics was only for the Tokyo Olympics and hopefully will never be done again because it was bad. I've had four people contact me. And it happened in the Belgian, see, now I'm remembering where the question came from. Facebook Messenger, somebody contacted me from Belgium and a top umpire in Belgium in a, in a top game gave a penalty corner for that. No, unless that's been put into your local regulations, which again is dangerous business, varying the rules of hockey, not a regulation, varying the rules is dangerous business in your local thing. Unless that's the case, it's a free hit. And for you too, AJ. Thank you. Daniel, read me the rule and you tell me where ample time to remove it is. Okay. Oh, sweeper keeper is a football reference. Obviously, I wouldn't know that. Stefan, okay, you're a little new to the stream, so you don't know how much I really don't pay attention to football or like it. Goalkeeper comes up, makes free hits and comes out more to save without the hand. Okay. Oh, sweeper. Okay. Like as in a sweeper, as in a defensive, like playing that back center. I play sweeper. So now I understand what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yep. Sorry. Nope. 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 Mm. It's, it's a technical requirement. It's very clear. There's no whatever. If the, if the defensive player touches the ball and they still have their face mask on and the corner is over. So there we go, Alex. And this is... Huh! I'm so mad. Can you tell? So we do have an exception for the KNHB. They are following the Tokyo regulation for no bloody good reason. And that's probably for every piece of equipment too, right, Alex? It's not just it's not not just face masks. They're talking about and this is an interesting I got 2 minutes for this. This is an interesting part of the rule that 
I hadn't really considered until I had a conversation with Rob Tancott about it, that it is arguable under the way the rules are written that knee guards and gloves can be worn at any time. That they are permitted after a penalty, before, after, whenever a penalty corner because of how things are written. It's not exclusionary. It's not, they aren't treated the same way that face masks are. Face masks are very clear that you can't wear them unless you are defending a penalty corner. Maybe that's a topic we can follow up on in the next one. But when you take that into consideration, awarding penalty corners for something that doesn't take away a penalty corner like opportunity for the attack, for something that happens outside the circle that is technical, that you don't have the ability to go, oh, ample time, and sorry, we're taking away that semifinal video referral thing, Argentina versus India, we're not talking about that. That was incorrect. End of story. So, I don't like calls like that, that disproportionately that award disproportionate team penalties for something so bloody technical. I think there's a good reason to have that rule in place. We don't want face masks being worn elsewhere because it can be dangerous, but we're not judging the danger. We're judging whether they actually have it on their face. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Yeah, so Stefan, that's the, that's the balance, right? And turning over the possession and giving a free hit outside the circle, I, I, I'm not super mad at that. Not the way that I'm super mad about all the other things that I've already said. <laughs> yeah, what the heck? No, I liked heck better. What the heck? Hi, Shane. Good to see you. They're allowed to play the ball if they pass it. Yes, that's fine. And that, ex that is in the guidance, okay? I'm talking about, it's, it's unlikely, again, so Scott, parse it back out. Sorry, I'm now going over time. Parse it back out that if you've been awarded a free hit, there's a free hit defense given. You're going to, it, yeah, okay, now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> You're very likely going to be inside the circle. You might be in between the circle and the dotted line. Which would mean that the penalty corner isn't, but the penalty corner is over when the free hit defense is awarded. So, yeah, you're not going to be far away <laughs> for that first action, for that first pass to be taken with the face mask on. Okay, that's kind of what I was getting to. Okay, what happened to the idea that PC defenders could basically have all the time to take the ball on not past the dashed line? They never had that. That was never a rule. That was just incorrect. If that was allowed, that's wrong. Sorry. So just to go back through this, Ian, um, if they had the time to take the ball out of the D, past the five meter dash line to maybe clear the ball. Yeah, no, they, they have to get rid of the ball by the time they get to that five meter dash. And now it's, it's getting more and more clear. Like they, the rules committee keeps honing down and making it simpler, but also making it more black and white, which is something you're going to see a lot of when the new rule book comes out, you're going to see a lot of black and white, by the way, get ready. I can't even, I can't even. This isn't the rules. This isn't the rules of hockey. And I know who's behind this, but he's not on the rules committee. So he doesn't have the jurisdiction to do that any more than I have the just jurisdiction to vary the rules of hockey that are played within Canada. Okay. So we'll do a follow-up topic. Thanks, Daniel, for the suggestion. Suggestion. There you go. Right? Like, isn't that insane? That is insane. 
And all this confusion, Thomas, has led you to stop wearing a mask on a PC, which is putting you in more danger, which is not what we want from any rule. You've been hit by a mask getting thrown, Goddard's, yeah. I've been close. I've seen, it's happened in, in international games. Maggie got hit. Alicia almost got hit. Um, yeah, it happens. That's, uh, sorry, it's still, that's still ridiculous. Still ridiculous. That is not, any of that is not part of the rules of hockey. Which decade will the new rule book come out in? AJ, it's, it's, it's going to come out very soon. That's what I've been told. Because they will want to get it changed as far in advance of the World Cup as they can, but they had to wait until Tokyo Olympics had been played. They will not change the rules within. We got pandemic problems, of course, but they don't want to change the rules within two years of a competition. So they'll change it two years or further. But what they've learned from experiences, the top teams get really mad if they have to learn how to play with new rules within like a year of the Olympics or the World Cup. And sorry, when I say years, I don't mean like 365 days. I mean calendar years. Good night, Ian. If the defender has time to place the ball for a free hit, they also have time to remove the mask. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but... I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to judge that because the guidance in the rules is very explicit that that exception is made that a free hit can be taken by the player with the mask on. <laughs> Godders. Yeah, that's. And that might have been a hangover from before when there was more ambiguity and people were putting their own like interpretations onto things. Not sure. Yes, it's a Kaylee hour now. And you've seen a bloody nose in it as her to throw a mask. Ah, that's awful. Okay. Right then, friends. Fantastic. I am so proud. I almost kept it to exactly a Kaylee hour, but you guys had great questions. And that's six questions. But next week, <coughs> excuse me. Next week, we're going to do the aerial quiz. Hopefully. So all of you who can speak native Dutch, please do come along because I'll need your help. Thank you so much for all your contributions. As always, you make this the stream that it is. So thank you so much. We will see you next week. And come to the Discord server. If you don't know where that is, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I'm choking here. FHEmpires.com forward slash Discord. Where is it? It's right here. Please come and join us. Uh, we're in there all the time. We almost have 350 members, which is amazing. And the discussions are awesome. And as you can see, they feed what I elaborate on in the live streams if I think they're interesting enough. So there you go. Yay. Glad you're looking forward to it. We will see you then. AJ, thanks so much for coming. And Lucio, great stuff. You got replay to catch up on CJ. I know you were late. And you have to clean the erasers. There you go. He lost the bet of only five items. He did. I don't know what he has to pay us, but he does. Good night, Roger. Thank you very much. It was fun. Have a great one, and we will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>